Hello and welcome to the online message for 15th of May 2022 from Lansdowne Evangelical Free Church. And this is a message for our evening service. If you've been following online, you will remember perhaps that two weeks ago we started a new series on the life of Joseph. This is message two of that series. This is part of a, wide, a, a longer series that uh, dates back a number of years. In the evenings before lockdown, we were going through the book of Genesis very gradually um, with a number of breaks, uh, but we, we did start in Genesis chapter one. And just before lockdown, we had started the life of Joseph, but for the sake of completeness, I've gone back to chapter 37 so that we can see uh, the whole narrative about this man Joseph and how God led and provided through great trouble to bring him to the place of being able to meet the needs for the rest of God's people. Indeed, many others were saved as a result of him being in Egypt. And of course, that points us forward to the Lord Jesus Christ, who came and suffered and was rejected. And of course, he died. His salvation wasn't um, through a, a physical provision of food, but his was the salvation of our whole beings for eternity through his death and resurrection upon the cross. And so it's my prayer that the life of Joseph would uh, magnify Jesus for us, but would also show us about perseverance and trust in the midst of trouble. But today's passage comes as a great warning. You may recall from a couple of weeks ago when we looked at Genesis 37 and the first 11 verses, the condition of the brothers and their attitudes. And this passage shows us how those attitudes and the state of their hearts bore fruit in the way they caused Joseph to suffer and sold him to Egypt, helped sold him to the Ishmaelites to take him to Egypt, and then uh, lying and lying for a long, long time to their father about what had happened to their brother Joseph. So let's pray. Let's read this passage and then we will, God, with God's help, open it up. Let's pray. Our Father, we come to you in the name of your dear Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the one who came to his own, his own did not receive him. He's the one who was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. And yet he is the one who has redeemed us, the one who laid down his life for his sheep, the one who's taken up his life again, the one who has come out of the tomb and ascended and is at your right hand interceding for us. Father, we thank you that because of him we can approach your throne of grace to find uh, mercy and grace to help in time of need. And we need you right now because we're going to look at your word and we want to hear your voice. We want you to speak to us. We need you to speak to us. Because Lord, our hearts grow cold and distracted and we stumble and fall into sin. And Lord, we need your truth to come to us tonight to set us free. So whether it is uh, at home in the evening or somewhere in the world elsewhere or on a bus or on the train as we listen with our headphones, wherever it may be, Lord God, speak to us, we pray, because your word is truth. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Chapter 37, verse 12 of the book of Genesis. And just very briefly, the change of background is because uh, my room is in need of some um, maintenance work. Um, so I'm in here uh, for uh, the next couple of weeks at least while things are put right. And I'll be back um, before my bookshelves uh, in a couple of weeks time. 
Let's hear the word of God in Genesis 37, starting at verse 12 and reading from the English Standard Version. Now his brothers, that is Joseph's brothers, now his brothers went to pasture their father's flock near Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, Are not your brothers pasturing the flock at Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And he said, Here I am. So he said to him, Go now, see if it is well with your brothers and with the flock, and bring me word. So he sent him from the valley of Hebron, and he came to Shechem. And a man was a man found him wandering in the fields. And the man asked him, What are you seeking? I am seeking my brothers, he said. Tell me, please, where are they pasturing the flock? And the man said, They have gone away, for I heard them say, Let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them at Dothan. Dothan. They, they saw him from afar. And before he came near to them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, Here comes the dreamer, come now, let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. Then we will say that a fierce animal has devoured him, and we will see what will become of his dreams. But when Reuben heard it, he rescued him out of their hands, saying, Let us not take his life. And Reuben said to them, Shed no blood, throw him into this pit here in the wilderness, but do not lay a hand on him that he might rescue him out of their hand and restore him to his father. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the robe of many colours that he wore, and they took him and threw him into a pit. The pit was empty. There was no water in it. Then they sat down to eat, and looking up, they saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing gum, balm and myrrh on their way to carry it down to Egypt. Then Judah said to his brothers, What profit is it if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother, our own flesh. <coughs> Excuse me. Then midnight traders passed by. And they drew Joseph up out, so they drew Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty shekels of silver. They took Joseph to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the pit and saw that Joseph was not in the pit, he tore his clothes and returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone, and I, where shall I go? Then they took Joseph's robe and slaughtered a goat and dipped the robe in the blood. And they sent the robe of many colours and brought it to their father and said, This we have found. Please identify whether it is your son's robe or not. And he identified it and said, This is my son's robe. A fierce animal has devoured him. Joseph is without doubt torn to pieces. Then Jacob tore his garments and put slack sackcloth on his loins, and mourned for his son many days. All his sons and daughters rose up to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted and said, No, I shall go down to Sheol to my son mourning. Thus his father wept for him. Meanwhile the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh captain of the guard. Praise God for his word. Now a few years ago I attended the funeral of my wife's boss who died of a very aggressive cancer. My wife asked her boss once how it started and she said it was a tiny grain of sand as it were. Of cancer in my leg and it spread to her whole body and it took her life. Proverbs 4.23 warns us, keep your heart with all diligence 
for from it, from it flows the springs of life. Keep your heart with all diligence. And Hebrews 12 and verse 15. See to it that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble, and by it many become defiled. See to it that no root of bitterness springs up and causes trouble. In the previous 11 verses, the cancer of hatred and jealousy had started in the hearts of Joseph's brothers. So verse 4, when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Verse 5, now Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. Verse 8, so they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. And then in verse 11, his brothers were jealous of him. Yes, there may have been reasons, and as we saw two weeks ago, understandable reasons why they felt aggrieved. Joseph was telling tales. Joseph was singled out by dad as a favored son and possibly the heir in place of Reuben. And then those dreams that uh, were so outrageous, even his father rebuked him. But the hatred and jealousy in the brothers' hearts had not been dealt with. And now they had grown. The cancer, as it were, had spread. And there were plans for murder, acts of violence, people trafficking and lies. And even though they step back from murder, in the end, the brothers are determined to get rid of the external source of their problem, that is Joseph, rather the, than the internal and underlying source of the problem, which was the sin in their hearts. The opportunity for this act of hatred and betrayal, for the fruit of this sin, to manifest is Joseph's obedience, which we see in verses 12 down to 17. We're told that the brothers in verse 12 have gone to pastor their, their flock um, some distance away in Shechem, and Joseph is requested, verse 13, by his father to go and see how his brothers are doing. We see here Joseph's obedience. He is a willing, obedient son. He doesn't refuse and say to his father, they hate me, I can't go. No, he is willing to go. In some ways, this parallels David that we saw in the morning message in 1 Samuel 17. He went obediently to his father's command to visit his brothers, this time as they were fighting or actually just standing in formation before the army of the Philistines. But for Joseph, the outcome of this obedience would be very different. David had the opportunity to slay the giant, although much later, David himself also went through great suffering and rejection, and he went down before finally being exalted as king. But here for Joseph, on this occasion, his obedience led him to be going down straight away before much later he is exalted by God. Notice that this is not an easy obedience despite the tale telling of the previous verses and perhaps his lack of wisdom in being so upfront about the dream that he'd had. Joseph could very easily have said, no, not only, well, uh, my brothers hate me, but it's a bit far. Uh, the commentaries tell me that Shechem was 50 miles from where they were living uh, in um, the, the, the valley of Hebron, which is mentioned in verse 14. And then 
Um, Shechem also is, is the, the city mentioned in chapter 34, where unsavory events take place and his family would have had a reputation. And then Joseph gets there in verse 15, um, when there and find a brother's not there, and then he has a further 15 mile journey, verse 17, to go to Dothan. So he's a willing, obedient son. But this leads us to, to, to mention something very important. Because you listen to popular teaching, Bible teaching, sermons today, and a lot of them say things like, well, if you just obey God, you'll be blessed. You need to obey God. If you're, the reason you're struggling is you're not obeying God. Well, here, in Genesis 37, Joseph is being obedient. He's being an obedient son, yes, to his earthly father, but as we know that uh, later when God fully revealed his law, the commandment, honour your father and your mother, Joseph was doing that. Joseph was honouring his father in obedience to God. And yet, this obedience did not lead to external and earthly blessing and comfort. Ultimately, and ultimately, there was a journey to be had and God brought him through to a place of blessing and prominence. But immediately following his obedience, trouble came. And we need to hear that message because often uh, the road of obedience is through, uh, to quote Psalm 23 verse 4, the valley of the shadow of death. And as we saw when we looked at Psalm 23, Three a few weeks ago, uh, the valley of shadow of death follows on immediately from Psalm 23, verse 3, where it speaks of him leading us in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And so those paths of righteousness, those paths of obedience, will often lead us into the valley. As the song says, the road marked with suffering. Blessed be his name, even on that road marked with suffering. That road includes injustice and trouble, even persecution. And the interesting thing is, Joseph could have avoided this if he had not been an obedient son. I say this reverently because Christ was sinless, but purely theoretically, Christ could have avoided the cross by being a disobedient son. And yet he said, not my will, but your will be done. Again, as a sim the hymn says, you chose the cross. He chose to go that way. He did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. So for Christ, for Joseph, and often for us, obedience leads to trouble. But as children of the Father, we display our love for the Father before this world by being obedient to him. So we need to proceed along the road of obedience, even though it may lead to the valley. And we can do so as we see for Joseph, as we see for Christ our Saviour. And as we will see on that final day, we too shall be exalted and vindicated and gloriously rewarded when we come out of the, 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 as the Heidelberg Catechism says, this veil of tears, we come through this veil of tears into the glorious new eternal day. And so let's not shy away from obedience because it's hard. Let's be those who obey his father, our father, just as Joseph obeyed his father. Let's be those who obey, yes, our earthly parents, but ultimately our Father God. Let's walk the road with our Saviour. Because actually, this road is not only often a road marked with suffering, but it's also a road of usefulness. 
Joseph may have had a nice comfortable life as the son and heir of Jacob as the favourite son had he stayed at home but he would never have been the one who through whom God brought a rescue out of famine all those years later and so it is with us often our usefulness increases in God's providential guidance of our lives as we obey him even though it may be hard and just one more thing before we move on to look at the brothers this these first few verses 12 to 17 those first six verses are just very ordinary Joseph is doing what any son would do any student in his father's house would do he's going to visit the the the, 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 the son's going to visit the flock see how things are doing and out of that comes all of this. David, as we saw in the morning message, was simply going about his ordinary business when God made the opportunity for his confrontation with Goliath and to be, the, as it were, the champion of God's people. And so let's not either shy away from ordinariness, because ordinariness is in God's hand an instrument that he uses to put us in the place he wants us to be, that we may serve him more effectively. But I said at the beginning that the, the, the real issue and the challenge of these verses is to examine how that hatred we saw last time in the brothers' hearts now begins to bear fruit. Joseph, as we see in verse 18, is noticed from afar. They saw him from afar. And uh, it may well have been or may have been understandable for us where they looked and, and saw their annoying little brother with these dreams and he was daddy's pet and he was his telltale that they might play some kind of joke on him and maybe scare him a bit. But we see that this hatred, and jealousy, this bitterness had grown into something so terrible it was affecting their moral judgment. It was affecting their view of life and death. It was affecting, surely they must have known what God said when um, they came, Noah and his family came out of the ark and God made it very clear uh, as he gave um, just one law. He gave a, the, the law that, that, that Noah could eat all things. But then he gave this other law that Man must not be slain. And judgment must come upon the man who slays another man. You can read about that in, in Genesis uh, chapter 8 and 9. So they must, surely they, surely that was passed on. And we know from uh, Romans 2 that the law of God is written on the heart, even of the unbeliever. So there's an understanding that murder is wrong. But this hatred had gripped them so much so that they were going to get rid of him. It says, uh, again, verse 18, they conspired against him to kill him. They dealt craftily, they plotted. Murder was in their hearts. You might say, this can, could never happen to me. And of course, I hope not, but we must be aware of the power of unchallenged sin in our hearts to grow into something that is actually too powerful. Added to the problem of verse 18 is verse 19 and 20. They said to one another, here comes a dreamer, come now let us kill him and throw him into one of the pits. So it's not just one person's hatred, but now we have this group and this group are spurring one another on to this act or this proposed act of murder. And when sin is shared with others who feel the same way, the danger gets even greater. When we're battling sin, we need to share with those who are stronger in faith, with those who actually are not necessarily struggling with this particular sin. We need to avoid those who would encourage us further in our sin or tell us it doesn't matter when it does matter. Then in verse, also in verse 20, um, at the end of verse 20, we see the root of sin. And the root of sin is opposition to God. It says at the end of verse 20, we will see what will become of his dreams. 
As mentioned last time, dreams like Joseph's were regarded as messages from God. So by planning to kill him, they were trying to put a stop to God's will. And sin at its heart is saying, I don't want God's will. I want to do it my way. And that becomes a habit and that can grow. That is why we must dig sin out of our hearts. That's why we must unroot any hatred or bitterness or jealousy because it will grow into something worse. Now in the providence of God, Joseph is preserved from death by Reuben intervention in verses 21 and 22. And we're told at the end of verse 22 that he had a plan to rescue uh, Joseph and take him back to his father. But Reuben is acting like a conspirator here. Now it may well be he wanted to find favour again with, with Jacob, as we saw last time he had gone in and slept with Rachel's maid. But he doesn't actually stand up and confront his brothers. He does it secretly. And actually, although God uses it to preserve Joseph's life, this is no real stand at all. And Reuben participates fully in the taking of Joseph, stripping of his robes and throwing him into the pit. The pit would have been a, 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 a cistern in the ground used for storage of water. They would fill up in the rainy months so there'd be water to drink for the different flocks and, and people living around. Um, but at this particular time, it was empty. So he is therefore abandoned and left to starve. And not only is there violence, that's the first fruit of hatred we see in these verses, 18 to 24. In the next section, verses 25 to 28, we see a second fruit of hatred, which is betrayal. But actually, I might add another to that, in that we also see the hardness of harm. Look at the beginning of verse 25. So he's in, Joseph is in the pit, verse 24, and then verse 25 says, straight away, then they sat down to eat. Now, wait a minute. They had just cut their brother in a hole. They had just abandoned their brother to suffering and starvation. And they're eating. Now, how far would they have had to move away? We don't know. But if you look in uh, Genesis 42, when they're reflecting back on this event, when they are being uh, challenged by Joseph, the governor of Egypt, and they don't recognise him. But listen to what they say in Genesis 42, 21. Then they said to one another, in truth, we are guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the distress of his soul when he begged us and we did not listen. So Joseph clearly cried out to his brothers for help, for kindness, for mercy. And what did they do? They simply ignored him and they ate. They would maybe hear the cries and this is all they moved just out of earshot, but they couldn't hear the cry, cries. How, what bitterness of heart this is. How dangerous it is. They are sin with a high hand and they're not bothered. How we must root out sin before it becomes like this. And yet it gets still worse. They sell him in verse 28. Yes, he'll be alive, but they'll get rid of him and make a profit out of it. They won't see him having that robe anymore. But their brother, their own flesh and blood, will now be a slave. They make it sound don't they, like doing him a favour. Judas saying, oh, he's our brother. Let's not kill him. But this is a tragic and terrible thing that they do. Again, it shows the length to which the root of bitterness can go. Brothers and sisters, guard your heart. Keep your heart. 
And then finally, we see the further fruit of sin. Not just hatred, but sin in general can lead to lies and cover up. We try and pretend we haven't sinned. We cover it up. And then very often if the sin it gets greater and greater, we're covering up more and more and we're lying and we're pretending and we're living, we're living a lie. The sin is there in our hearts and we know it's there and it's there in the secret place. Or maybe that bitterness and hatred is still there, taking a grip on our hearts, but we meet people and we go out and we smile and we look nice, but there it is in our hearts, changing us, eating away it within us. And we see what happens now. So Reuben comes back, verse 29, verse 30, and realizes nothing to be done. So now he joins this conspiracy. And they know Joseph is alive. And yet they pretend he's dead. They take the robe, verse 31, they cover it with blood, they send it to their father, and, 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 and the sense here, maybe they sent it ahead of them so that he got it um, before they got there. Uh, we don't know that for sure, but this cowardly act, they have sold their brother into slavery, and they're pretending that he's dead, and they're allowing their father to think that he's gone, and yet they know he's alive. Yet they know he's probably suffering because he's a slave who's gone down to Egypt. They don't know, verse 36, that we know. And verse 36 uh, uh, is the final word we have until verse chapter 39, because verse 38 then provides for us an insight into the life of Judah, who was the one who suggested the sending of Joseph down to Egypt. And we will look at that next time because it's an important contrast between Joseph the one who God is going to raise up, and Judah, who is living a life of sin and, uh, and fleshiness, before much, much later, which we'll see towards the end, where he then is prepared to stand in for his brother Jet Benjamin uh, and take the punishment. What a chain God can do. And it's the encouragement of these verses, how deep and badly these brothers have fallen, how hatred and sin has gripped them. But then it is also a story of redemption, about how they're restored to their brother later on. It's not just about Joseph being exalted, but it's also an encouragement to those of us who struggle with bitterness and hatred and besetting sin to know that there is a way back, there is a way of restoration, and just as God did for the brothers, so God can do for us. And we're going to close with a few thoughts on that in a couple of moments. A few more things just to point out about the hardness of heart. Look at verse 32. Please identify whether it is your son's robe, not our brother's robe. Again, hardening their heart. And then just a small little calculation for you to show the extent to which their lies went. If you turn to chapter 41, and verse 46, you will see it says this, Joseph was 30 years old when he entered the service of Pharaoh. And then turn to chapter 45 and verse six. This is Joseph speaking to his brothers the second time they come down to Egypt. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there'll be neither plowing nor harvest. Now, a little bit of maths. Joseph was um, 17 in chapter 37, verse 2. Joseph is 30 in chapter 41, verse 46. That's 13 years. Assuming there was uh, not much gap between these in, in chapter 37. And then in chapter 45, verse 6, there's a seven years of plenty plus two years of famine, which is a further um, nine years, again, assuming the, fam the, the plenty came straight away, essentially what I'm trying to tell you is there's at least 22 years of cover-up. Every day, the hatred and bitterness and jealousy kept, and possibly shame, because 
They knew Joseph was alive and they could see their father's grief every day, but their hardness of heart kept them sinning and covering for 22 years. This is the power of unconfessed sin and the power of hatred and why we must root it out. The good news is you don't have to wait 22 years. You can come now to the Saviour. You can come now to the Saviour for the first time. If bitterness and hatred has kept you out of even believing in the Lord, turning from your sin, you justified your anger and your hatred for years and years and years, and you know God calls you to forgive. That's why you haven't come to him. There's no other way to be set free. There's no other way to have eternal life. There's no other way to be forgiven of this sin and the sin that have flowed out of your bitterness. You need to come to him. Just before I, 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 I did this recording, um, I read a chapter of a, of a commentary on Genesis by a, 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 a brother called James Montgomery Boyce, an American pastor who's with the Lord now. And the chapter was called, Who Grieves for Joseph? And he looked at how the only person to grieve for Joseph was the Jacob and all these uh, different situations and how Joseph must have felt alone, but how the Father God Almighty was watching over him and made the way for him. But you know, it led me to think of something else. Not only who grieves for Joseph, but who grieved over the hard hearts of the brothers? Who grieves over our hard hearts? Luke chapter 13 and verse 34, the words of Jesus. O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to it. How often would I have gathered your children together as a hen gathers her brood under her wings, yet you were not willing. And then in Luke 19, Luke 19 and verse 41. When he drew near the city of Jerusalem, that is, he wept over it. Who grieves over hard hearts? The Lord Jesus grieves over hard hearts. And he welcomes sinners. And he welcomes prodigals. That is those who believe, yet have moved away and have walked away from the Lord because they have fallen into sin. Because their hearts have grown hard. He welcomes sinners and prodigals even though with bitterness in their heart. And you can come to him right now. Let me give you some guidance as to how and how we can root out bitterness and sin from our hearts. The first is that wonderful and most glorious declaration in 1 John 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Please confess your sin to him. Please tell him your sin and call upon him. And then we need to consider our great debt. This will help us to realise when we're sinned against, then we also need to forgive. You know, I'm sure the parable of the ungrateful servant, unforgiving servant in Matthew 18, 21 to 32. He was forgiven a great debt and he would not forgive a small debt. We've been forgiven a great debt through the, the cross of God the Son, the Lord Jesus, in our place. That great debt surely means we can do what it says in Ephesians 4.32. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And it was not specifically hatred and bitterness, but sin in, a sin in general, another kind of besetting sin. We look at the cross and we see the debt that's been paid for us and realise this debt is covered too. So let's leave that at the foot of the cross and turn away from it. In repentance. But sometimes our trouble is caused by people who are not believers. 
And so forgiveness seems harder and we can find ourselves in the, the, the position of the psalmist in Psalm 73 when he looked at the prosperity of the wicked and he was envious. And so we need to consider the majesty and justice of God. So Psalm 73 and verse 16, but when I thought how to understand this, that is how to understand how the, how the world seemed to succeed and we struggle so much as believers, when I sought to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned their end. And so he goes on to say, Psalm 20, Psalm 73, verse 1, when my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I'm continually with you and you hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel and afterward you receive me into glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth I desire besides you. And so not just with believers, but with the world in general, we're reminded in Romans 12 and verse 19, Beloved, never avenge yourself, but leave it to the wrath of God, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Let us have that Christ-like attitude. And let us also be like the Lord Jesus Christ. It says in Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 3, Hebrews 12 and verse 3. Consider him who endured from sinners such hostility against himself so that you may not grow weary and faint-hearted. And 1 Peter 2 and verse 23. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He entrusted himself to him who judges justly. We may have reason for bitterness to those around us, but we must lay at the foot of the cross. We must entrust ourselves to him. We must remind ourselves of what our Lord Jesus suffered on our behalf, the hostility he suffered, and realize we're walking in his steps. And we say to the Lord, it's yours to take action in this situation. And we seek the help of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 5.22, fruit of the Spirit, includes peace. Romans 12 again, Romans 12 verse 18, if possible, as far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. And so because we know that being at peace, not harboring a grudge, not holding bitterness, not allowing hatred to grow, indeed not allowing any sin to grow, is part of God's will. And therefore, because it's God's will, we can seek the help of the Holy Spirit. And we can, again, as Romans tells us early in Romans 8, we can put things to death by the Spirit and we can grow in godliness. May God help us to walk free from hatred, or jealousy, or any sin. May he help us to see the finished work of Christ, where the price has been paid in full, even for hatred. And may we forget what is past and press on to the price where sorrow, grief, tears, suffering, and pain are gone forever. Let's pray. Our Father, we realise this is a serious message and I pray, Father, where we need to be convicted, challenged by the message, Lord, you would work by your Spirit to bring that conviction and repentance and confession, and calling upon you and considering the great debt that's already been paid for us, committing ourselves to you, Lord, even though we feel aggrieved by what others have done to us and where other sins have taken root, help us to put them to death by the Spirit. All those misdeeds of the flesh, help us to fix our eyes on Jesus, 
the author and perfecter of our faith. Help us to uh, set our mind on things above and to put to death that which is of the earth. And Lord God, where the enemy bring, is bringing condemnation, help us to consider him who went to the cross and how every bitter thought and every evil deed was laid upon him. And help us to walk in freedom with our eyes upon the price. That we will be a people who live for your glory, even though it may be on a road marked with suffering. Lord, hear our prayers and change us for your glory. For we ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Brothers and sisters, may God use this word to do you good, whatever that might be. And if you listen to it and you are thanking God, I actually don't hold a grudge. I'm free from any bitterness or jealousy. And praise God, but I encourage you to pray for those you know who are gripped. The Spirit of God will come and point them to Jesus and set them free. Lord bless you in abundance and thank you for listening.